evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Starting a book, of, starting a new book today, the book of Ecclesiastes. The word in the Hebrew for Ecclesiastes is Kohaleth, and it means the assembler or the convener. It's also called the preacher in the English. And who wrote this was Solomon, the, the son of David, who would take the throne after David died. And it, it see people um, they disagree on on when this was written or what part of Solomon's life it was written. But I think it was, it's very likely that it was written at the very end of Solomon's life. We learn in 1 Kings chapter 11 that Solomon allowed his hundreds of foreign wives to turn him over to idolatry. He started to worship their gods, fell into idolatry. But you see, what he's basically all throughout this book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon is telling us, do not follow the ways of the world. It's, it's all emptiness if you just follow the ways of the world. Anything other than following God is just emptiness. So I think it's very likely that at the very end of Solomon's life, he did repent. And he came out of the idolatry and, and that he, he started to serve Yahweh again, the one true God. Now that, that's just my opinion, but you'll see why I think that as we go through this book of Ecclesiastes. And it, it's interesting that there's a phrase used in this book, it's under the sun. And the, the phrase under the sun is used 29 times in the Bible, and all 29 times is in this book of Ecclesiastes. And that means it's, it's written to a man in, the, in a flesh body. And it, it's amazing, this book, it's just about 12 straight chapters just teaching us how to be happy in the flesh. So there is so much incredible wisdom that, that we get that the Holy Spirit gives us through these scriptures. So let's ask the word of wisdom from our Father and get right into it. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word and we thank you for giving us this building so we have a place to fellowship in your name and to share your word with others. And we ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to understand and teach your word. And we ask that your words be spoken tonight and your will be done. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. So, all right, we'll pick it up, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1. Kohaleth, the assembler or the convener, chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, and remember, that's Solomon. And it's interesting, you have this phrase, the words of. And there's, it's, there's a couple other books, such as Deuteronomy, Amos, that, that they start out this way, the words of. And it, it often has to do with it. it's giving us correction. And there is a, a lot of correcting that's going on in this book. So verse 2. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Vanity, what this means is emptiness or something that will soon vanish. Something that's unsatisfactory. And this, this has a great emphasis in the Hebrew in this verse. And it, it's just saying that anything that is apart from God... It, it, it's all emptiness. It, it's not going to bring you anything in the long run. It's all emptiness. It's all unsatisfactory. Verse 3. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? There's that first use of this phrase, under the sun. And it, 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 what it, when it says under the sun, it's basically saying that man apart from God. So all, what he's going to be talking about in this chapter is when he's saying under the sun, this is how it would be if you just focus completely on the flesh, completely on the world, and you left God completely out of the equation. So he's saying, what, what profit is there of all your labor if you do that, if you only focus on the world instead of God? Verse 4, one generation passeth away and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. And check out this word generation in your Psalms. It means revolution of time or even an age. And what you can it takes us right to the how we have the three earth ages. How, how the first earth age was destroyed because of Satan's rebellion. But we still have the same earth. The earth still abides, but we're in a new age. We're in the second earth age now. And when we go into the third earth age, when it becomes rejuvenated, the earth will, as it's written in the book of Revelation chapter 21, it will still be the same earth, even though we do go from age to age. Verse 5, The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The sun comes up in the east, it sets in the west, and then it does it all again the next day. Verse 6, The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north, 
It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. Even you have the change of seasons, how, how it will turn from season to season. And the, the wind, no one can control the wind. But it just happens because God said it that way. It's the natural way of things. Verse 7. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place, unto the place from whence the rivers come, there they return again. The rivers run into the sea, and then you have you have that humidity, the evaporation, it comes up and it turns into clouds, and then it rains, and then it starts all over again. That perfect cycle. And what it, what we're gonna get to is that that there's nothing new under the sun, as we're gonna read. It all remains the same when it comes to the world, to nature, and to, to anything, actually. Verse 8. All things are full of labor. This means weariness. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. If you were to only focus on the ways of the world and things you could gain, your eye would never be satisfied with the things that you see. I mean, you're just going to continually want more and more and more because you won't be content. The only way to actually be content in this world is to have the love of our Heavenly Father, the love of Jesus Christ. Or else you'll never be content. You always just want more and more and more. But as Paul would teach us in his epistles, he said, I learned to be happy, to be content with whatever I have. And that's, how, that's the peace of mind and the happiness you get with the love of Jesus Christ in your heart. But if you don't have that, you're just going to be continually seeking more and more and you'll never be satisfied. Verse 9. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. That everything that already has happened will happen again, basically. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, it says all these things that happen, and it's giving you different details of things that happened in the Old Testament. It said all these things happen for examples, for our admonishment, for our warning upon whom the ends of the earth shall come. So that, that's why we look back to the Old Testament so often and we see what happened there because it's going to happen again. And that, that's why it's you, it would be the biggest mistake you could make just to leave off the Old Testament because it gives us all the types to show us what's going to happen even to the future today. So there's nothing new under the sun. Verse 10. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath already, it hath already of old. It hath been already of old time which was before us. And everything that's happened before will happen again. Verse 11. There is no remembrance of former things. Now you see the, the word things is in italics. That means it's been added. From the Hebrew, this should be translated as the word men. So let's read it as it should be translated. There is no remembrance of former men. Neither shall there be any remembrance of men that are to come with those that come, shall come after. And, and think about it. I mean, you, we don't even know who like, our, our great, great, great grandfather. I mean, we don't even know who they were. We don't even know who their name, what their names are. So this is saying times goes by and people get forgotten. It, it does not matter what you gained in this life because you can't take anything with you except your works, your righteous acts. So if, if you just went through life just trying to just build up treasure on earth, but you never served God, guess what? Another two or three generations, it's all completely forgotten and everything you did was for nothing if you didn't try to serve God and you only tried to please yourself. Verse 12. I, the preacher, remember that's Kobalim, the convener, the assembler, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. And remember, this is Solomon, David's son. Verse 13. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. Now it's very important that you don't read over that. He said that he's seeking the wisdom of all things that are done under the heaven. And some manuscripts even here it reads under the sun. So it's saying he sought out to seek wisdom of the flesh, of the world. Trying to figure out all he can about the world. Not God's wisdom. But he's just trying to figure out anything that he can about the world, how it is, how people act. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. And the exercise means that they will be humbled. And when you just continually just seek after wisdom of the world, it will make you very weary, it will make you tired, and you will be even humbled by it because you realize that it's all vanity, it's all emptiness. Verse 14, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. 
And behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Remember, vanity means emptiness, something that soon vanishes, something that's unsatisfactory. And this vexation of spirit, check it out. Ve vexation means to grasp after. And spirit is, is ruach, is the wind. So what this is saying, it's just like chasing the wind. If you just if you seek out philo philosophical research, you're just trying to see oh what what happens here that makes a man act this way or what what why are people acting this way and you're just seeking out philosophy, it, it just it brings you nothing. And just like it says in Colossians chapter two verse eight, it says beware lest anybody deceive you through philosophy through the traditions of men. You're only going to be brought down by it. It's not going to give you happiness. It's not going to give you any true wisdom, which only comes from God. Verse 15. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. And when you do, just seek, you're seeking after philosophy. You're seeking after the different things of the world. You, you start to see all the bad things that are in the world, and you realize you can't make that straight. There's nothing, there's nothing you can do to help that. And what's wanting cannot be numbered. You start seeking after other things that you maybe wouldn't have even ever thought of if you hadn't looked into these ways of the world. But now all of a sudden you're seeking after them. You want them. And it can't even be numbered, all the things that you now want. Because you decided you wanted man's wisdom instead of God's wisdom. Verse 16. It only brings sadness. It won't do anything for you. Verse 16. I communed with my own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate. This means he came to great power. And no doubt Solomon was the most powerful man in the entire world at that time. And I've gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. But what did it do for him? Let's find out. Verse 17. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. Folly, it even means infatuation. He, he became infatuated with his foreign wives. He became infatuated with, with their heathen gods. And he fell into idolatry because he sought out the wisdom of men instead of the wisdom of God. I, I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. He was just chasing the wind. And you see, at this time of this writing, he realized that that's all he was doing was chasing the wind. So that's, that's why, because of the things like this that are written in this book, I think it's most likely he wrote this at the end of his life. But once again, that's just my opinion. But he, but he thought, he, he, I mean, he realized it was just chasing the wind when he was doing this. It did nothing for him. Verse 18, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increases sorrow. Remember, this is the wisdom that he saw of things done under heaven. I mean, he saw how wicked the world was, realized, I can't do anything about this. He saw how evil some men are, and all it did was bring him sorrow. It brought him grief. Well, that's, what, that's what you get when you seek the wisdom of the world. When he could have been seeking the wisdom of Almighty God, and would have brought him the exact opposite. It would have brought him peace, happiness, comfort. So understand that the wisdom of the world, it will do nothing for you. Let's go right into chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. That means blithfulness, glee. Therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this is also vanity. It's also emptiness. So he realized that trying to look out all these philosophical ways, all these different wisdoms of men, he realized that's not going to do me any good at all. So now I'm just going to seek cheerful enjoyment. I'm just going to try to do anything I can that will bring me happiness. That's what Solomon's doing now. Verse 2. I said of laughter is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? What good does it actually do me to just to have cheerful enjoyment, just to have parties, just to give himself unto wine? He realized that that's not doing anything for me, even though it might have made me happy there at the time. But then when, when the very night comes in and you go to sleep and you realize that you did nothing for God, that you're just going about just doing nothing worthwhile in this world, you don't have peace, you don't have comfort and happiness. Verse 3, I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. So he tried to, he tried to give himself unto wine, just give himself unto partying. But he, all, he was, what he's saying here, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to party, I'm just going to have a good time, but I'm going to try to seek after wisdom also. 
But you see, that doesn't work. Make a note of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21. It says, you cannot be a partaker of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker of the Lord of the table of devils and the table of the Lord. you got to pick one or the other. You can't give yourself the wine and give yourself to God. You can't give yourself to the ways of the world and God. you got to choose one. Verse 4, I made me great works. I built me houses. I planted me vineyards. Verse 5. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. Check out this word orchards in your songs. The Hebrew word is paradise, and it, it paradise, and it, that's even what it sounds like is what it means. It means a paradise. Solomon even made his own paradise, made his own park, trying to make himself heaven on earth, basically. Because he decided, all right, wisdom of the world's not getting it done. I'm just going to give get myself everything I can, anything I can even think of to make myself happy. But remember, he's put God out of the equation. He's not thinking about God. So he even made his own paradise. There is no paradise on earth in a flesh body. Verse 6, I made me pools of water to, to water there with the wood that bringeth forth trees, the forests. Verse 7. He even, I mean, he had his own irrigation system going. I mean, he had it going on. He had everything. The most powerful man, the most the richest man in the whole world. But he's saying it was all emptiness. Verse 7. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I mean, he's saying, I, I am more, I am richer than anybody that there's ever been. The richest man in the world. He, he had servants, so then, then he then he's taking them to as wives, and then there he's even getting kids that are just becoming servants in his house. I mean, all, he would have just had to say the word, and anyone would have done anything for him. But it didn't bring him happiness. Verse 8. I gathered me also silver and gold, and the peculiar treasure of kings and of provinces. It says in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 27, that Solomon had so much silver in Jerusalem that it was just as if it was just stones. I mean, just so much gold, so much silver. It was, it, it was just so much you couldn't even imagine how rich he was. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. I mean, had his own band, had his own orchestra. I mean, he could have just walked around. If he wanted, he could have just been walking around and had his own theme music going. I mean, Solomon had everything that you could ever imagine. Verse 9. So I was great. He had power and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And th this is talking about actual wisdom from God. And do you know why it remained with him? It's because of what we read in Romans chapter 11, verse 29. It says that the calling and the gifts of God are without repentance. Because God, God did give Solomon so much wisdom. You remember when I said that he was, the, he was the, probably the wisest man that there ever was in the flesh, aside from Jesus Christ, because Christ is Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. But as far as actual men go, Solomon was the wisest there, there ever was. And we're going to read that. But his wisdom remained with him because God had a purpose for Solomon. His purpose was to write this book of Ecclesiastes, to write Proverbs, to write the Song of Solomon. So God gave him that gift without repentance. So that wisdom remained with Solomon. Now let's document where it says Solomon was the wisest of them all. Turn with me back to 1 Kings chapter 3. You got Kings right after Samuel and right before the book of Chronicles. So for, remember, Kings is written from man's point of view. Um, Chronicles is written from God's point of view. So we're going to pick it up in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. And it reads, In Gibeon, that's the high place, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. God appears to Solomon in a dream and he says, Well, what do you want, Solomon? I ask, you ask me what you want in life. Verse 6. And make note, this is right as soon as Solomon became king, basically. Or this right at the start of him becoming king. Verse 6. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he has walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. All the kings after David would be compared to him because he never fell away to idolatry. 
And thou hast kept of him, or thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Verse 7. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. Notice how humble Solomon's being. He's, he's calling himself God's servant, and that's exactly what he is. That's what we all are. And but I and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. Solomon was about 20 years old when he took the throne. So he's saying to God, look, God, I, I don't know how to be king. I'm just a kid based. I'm only 20. I don't know what I'm doing here. Verse 8. And thy servant, remember, notice the humbleness of Solomon. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen. A great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. That the, the people of Israel, those that people that God told Abraham that you will, your, your seed will be numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. And remember, many of you are of the ten northern tribes of Israel. Verse 9. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this this thy so great a people. What did Solomon ask for? He asked for an understanding heart to judge the people. All he wanted was for God to give him the wisdom to be able to, to be a good king. So you see how good of a man that Solomon was. He fell into he fell away into idolatry, the idolatry later. And make no mistake, that's really, really bad, but we don't judge Solomon. I mean, Solomon did a lot of good things. But you see how humble and how much of a good man he was at the start of his reign. All he asked for was an understanding heart to judge the people. Verse 10, And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And of course it did. I hope you understand how much it pleases the Lord when you ask Him for wisdom. Not just for yourself, but why did Solomon ask for it? He asked for it so he could be a good king to the people. And it pleases God so much when we ask Him for wisdom so that we can, be, we can be a help to the people. So we can share God's Word for God. Give us the ability to simplify it so anybody can understand it. That pleases God greatly and you will be greatly blessed if you ask for blessings. Not real necessarily for yourself, but to help others. Verse 11, And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, Neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. 12. Behold, I have done according to thy word. So lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. I mean, the wisest man there ever was. Because he, because he wasn't seeking the things of the world at this time. He only wanted wisdom so he could be a good king to the people. So God gave it to him exactly as he asked. But what else did God give him? Verse 13. And I have also given thee what thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And we just read in Ecclesiastes it came to pass. I mean, he was so rich. He was the richest of them all. Had his own band, had his own irrigation system, made his own paradise. I mean, Solomon had everything. Well, why? Because God gave it to him. Because God blessed him. So I hope that you would never listen to somebody that would try to tell you it's a sin to be rich. Because Solomon was the richest of them all because he was blessed. You read in the book of Job, chapter 1, that Job was one of the... He was basically the richest man there was at that time. The richest man of the East at that time. And it said that Job walked with a perfect heart and he hated evil. So he was blessed by God. He was very wealthy. So it is no sin to be wealthy if it's by the blessings of God. But if it's by the ill-gotten gains, yeah, then you then you got to take it off if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. But riches is a blessing. If you, if it, you get it from God, it is no sin. It's a blessing. So God's going to give him all those things. And he didn't even ask for it. But God gave it to him anyway because he had a sincere heart. Verse 14. And if thou wilt walk in my ways. That's a condition. Don't overlook that. If thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments. As thy father David did walk. Then I will lengthen thy days. There is always a condition when it comes to God's blessing. You've got to walk in his ways. You've got to keep his commandments. You've got to... Do your very best to follow God's way and His law. We all sin. We all fall short. 
But when you do sin, just repent and it's erased. And then don't commit that sin anymore. But I mean, you will be so blessed. Look how much God blessed Solomon because he had a sincere heart. And he only wanted to help his people. And he'll, I mean, he'll do the same for you. He will give you wisdom. He will make you prosperous in anything you do. And that's biblical. If you set your heart to follow him at all costs. Okay, let's go back to Ecclesiastes. Let's just do a couple more verses. Back to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Or no, we're in chapter 2 actually. Picking it up, chapter 2, about verse... Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 10, and it reads... And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. We're back to all he, all he wants to do is just make himself happy. Just give himself whatever he wants. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of, of all my labor. He, he just used any chance he get just to have fun, just to have a party, just to bring himself happiness of ways of the world. Remember, this is not at the beginning of Solomon's reign. At his beginning, he had a, a sincere heart toward God. But then he, he lost his way. And be, because, because, he, because he just decided, I, who knows why exactly he started doing it, but one of the main reasons, 1 Kings chapter 11, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, many of them who were foreign. And they worshipped, and they worshipped idols, they worshipped gods that don't even exist. But Solomon fell away into it, even into Molochism, even to sacrificing children to the fire. I mean, Solomon fell into it. But that wisdom that God gave him, it still remained with him. And it gave him the ability to write this book of Ecclesiastes to, to let us know, don't go in the way that I did. God given us this scripture to make you understand that, it, that you can fall away. Even the wisest man there ever was, Solomon. He fell into the ways of the world. So God's given us this scripture to make sure that we do not do it. The wisdom of the world doesn't do anything for you. And just to try to bring yourself happiness with ways of the world, that doesn't do anything either. Let's go one more verse. Verse 11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on, and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun. It was just like he was chasing the wind. That's what that vexation of spirit means. I mean, he had no profit under the sun. Trying to get all this philosophical wisdom that men said. And you'll see people trying to do that today. You'll see them go off precedent rather than let, let's find out what God's word says. Oh, well, let's see what the elders of the church said. But you see, that doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't matter what the elders of the church said. It matters what God said. So God given us this amazing book of Ecclesiastes, this book written to man under the sun, and to show us that you, no matter how rich you are, as Solomon was, he was the richest man, he was the most powerful, but he had no happiness. It was all emptiness. It was all something that would soon vanish, and it was, it was, just, it was nothing to him. Because remember, and we're going to read in the, when we get to the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes, when your flesh body dies, your spiritual body goes back to the Father. That spiritual body that we were in for eons of time before God placed our soul in our mother's womb. So, and remember, what, what is the only thing you get to take with you? It's Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, Revelation chapter 19, verse 8. The only thing you get to take with you is your righteous acts, your good works. And you will be rewarded by them. But as far as money, as far as just, just playing around, having a good time, that does nothing for you in a flesh body. But don't, don't make the mistake also. God gave us this world so we could enjoy it. He gave us things that could bring us happiness. But So what's the point? You don't seek them instead of seeking God. You seek God first always. And so Solomon didn't even ask for riches. He only asked for wisdom. Yet God gave him riches. He gave him long life. And it will please God so much to bless us when we just seek after him and his wisdom. Not for ourselves, but for the people. And he will give us even things that we did not ask for. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word. And we thank you for this book of Ecclesiastes. That So you, you told us exactly how we can be happy in these flesh bodies. And we, we just thank you so much for giving us this wisdom. 
that would be impossible to attain without studying your word. We just thank you for giving us the ability to understand your word and to share it with others. And we, get, we thank you for giving us this building so we have a place that we can share your word with others exactly as it's written. And we just ask you to continue to guide us with your Holy Spirit so we can be a blessing to you and to help share your word with others and to help to bring them to your love, Father. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. This is recorded at Smyrna Christian Church, 1623 North Purdom, Kokomo, Indiana. Come join Pastor Jesse Sisk on Wednesday, Thursdays, and Fridays at 7 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. God bless. September 26, 2019.